The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I am Michael Barham, and this is our first EPIP webinar of 2013, From Gender Theory to Gender Transformative Giving. I'll be your host, and our primary and actually only speaker will be Ricky Wilchins. She'll be taking us on her personal and professional journey from LGBT rights and gender identity to gender transformative approaches. Um, before we get things going, for those of you unfamiliar with EPIP, we are a national network of foundation professionals and social entrepreneurs who strive for excellence in the practice of philanthropy. Our mission is to develop emerging leaders committed to building a just, equitable, and sustainable society. A few upcoming EPIP announcements. We're very, very excited for our 2014 National Conference. It's the Unity Summit in, partner, in partnership with Joint Affinity Groups. It'll be on June 6th through June 8th, and we will be advancing equity together. Um, an important note on that, there is an EPIP-only portion of the conference, and the call for sessions is actually currently open. So if you're interested in submitting a proposal, please visit our website. We've also just opened up registration for the entire Unity Summit, so please find that information on our website as well. It's going to be a game-changing conference. Um, we're also hosting a webinar in two weeks. We actually are partnering with Public Allies on a four-part series around innovative funding for social change, and we'll be beginning with Social Impact Bonds 101. We've got a couple of NYU social enterprise and law fellows joining us. It's going to be a really fascinating conversation, so look out for that. And as always, to find EPIP events near you or on the national stage, visit epip.org slash events. Okay, before we get started, a couple items for housekeeping. We're keeping you all on mute. If you're calling in on the phone, please do us a favor and make sure to mute your computer. If you have any questions or technical difficulties, use the question box and we'll make sure to handle those for you. And if you have questions for Ricky, please submit them throughout and uh, we'll reserve some time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. And a final note, we'll be recording this webinar. It'll be available on our EPIP YouTube page. So if you for any reason have to hop off, you'll always be able to go back um, and take a look at the webinar. Okay, today's speaker is Ricky Wilchins. Ricky is the executive director of True Child and the author of three books on gender theory. True Child is a research and action center that promotes gender transformative approaches to at-risk youth that reconnect race, class, and gender justice. And without further ado, I am going to pass it over to our speaker, Ricky. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. And Emily, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I want to make sure that you'll be able to see my screen in a moment. One second. Oh, we're doing... <laughs> um, there we go, show my screen. And it should be up. There we go. So um, um, usually when I do this presentation, I talk strictly about uh, issues of gender and philanthropy. But I was asked to talk a little bit about kind of my personal journey and how you know gender theory particularly um, plays a role. I had a young program officer come up to me at a presentation I was doing for Women's Funding Network, and she said, you know, I I kind of studied all this stuff in grad school, but I always felt like I had to park it at home and keep it separate from my day job in philanthropy. And I said, you know, my experience is just the opposite. This has always been really critical to how I understand what we're trying to do in, in philanthropic and social justice work. And I'm hoping to talk a little bit about that before we kind of dive into the specifics today. But I actually started my work 
1994 in nonprofits trying to put gender identity and expression on the map back when well there was literally zero funding for it. It's now probably in the well into the millions, but we couldn't uh, we couldn't even get a hearing. Nobody even understood the the language. But it was interesting because we started out talking about gender nonconforming and transgender youth, and as the as the movement started to pick up steam, suddenly transgender started to solidify into this hardwired identity, just like everything else. And there was this real fight about whether we should be an identity-based group or not. And I remember we started helping this young, actually lesbian woman who worked in New York of all places and had been fired for looking too butch. I always like that's an oxymoron, too butch, like military intelligence or jumbo shrimp. How can you be too butch? But anyway, she was fired for looking too butch, and we started working with her. And about half the board got up in arms because she wasn't transgender identified. And I said, you know, why would we care? She was discriminated against because of her, you know, her gender identity expression. It should be the issue, not the identity. And then there was a young black woman who um, was refused a promotion at Harvard because one of her bosses, a male bosses, said that she dressed in a distracting manner. And her claim was, look, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the only women on this floor and one of the only black people on this floor. I am hyper visible. And the fact that you can't keep your eyes off me is your problem, not mine, as long as I'm dressing appropriately. And again, there was a lot of blowback. We were working with someone who, in this case, wasn't even LGBT identified. But again, I said, you know, it, it needs to be the issue that we're looking at, not the identity. And so we finally got um, a grant from. Lauren Harris at the Ford Foundation to work with um, young black men, and that I think was kind of the grant that really pulled us into looking at gender as a this broader issue, and um, and not just are you LGBT, or are you gender nonconforming, but the ways that gender norms you know hurt and can constrict all all young people, whatever their identity, and that was when we kind of left behind the LGBT wrapper and we launched and we branded it as True Child. So. It's been kind of a journey, of, and it's been informed at every step, I think, for me, from what I learned about, you know, gender theory and what's called queer theory and postmodernism, um, things that, you know, identities are political positions. I mean, obviously, they're very important to us, and they're really strong uh, places to do organizing from, but, you know, identities are also political positions that you don't want to take too seriously or get, get stuck siloing all your work. Um, within them. Um, it taught me to look at soft power, you know, especially because so much of our understanding of social justice comes from civil rights. And you think about the hard power of, you know, nightsticks and courts and police and so forth. But when it comes to issues of gender, it's the soft power that um, postmodernism looked at of interactions among people and um, the the kind of capillary and diffuse power that comes in interchanges at, at a very broad level. For instance, if you give a if you give a crying infant to a pair of parents and tell them it's a boy, they'll they'll say, oh, he's he's mad. If you tell them it's a girl, they'll say, oh, she she's sad. They'll promptly begin bouncing the boy. With the girl, um, um, they'll begin to stroke her and soothe her. So these these things that shape us into these gender roles. Um, start very, very young and um, are a kind of capillary and diffuse power that comes from the bottom up, not from the top down, from big visible sources of power in, you know, concrete buildings. Um, one of the primary things the gender system uses, actually, especially with young people, is shame, um, which is a very internal thing. Again, not the kind of power that what we normally think about in social justice or even the kind of power we can see. And I think that's Part of the reason we sometimes have trouble understanding gender is this kind of squishy thing where most of us kind of get raped in class. Gender seems a little squishy. We're not sure how to um, identify it or, or describe it. And finally, I, gender theory taught me to look at the intersections of people's lives. You know, normative categories tend to exert this power to simplify everything. And yet, most of us are not just, you know, of color or not just LGBT or not just you know, whatever. We live our lives at the intersections of identity where things are messy and complicated and our approach to philanthropy and social justice ought to be too and it should it should recognize the kind of lives that people actually live. So 
what that kind of led me into was um, working more with philanthropic institutions um, to try to help them wrap their minds around how you could do this intersection back to um, race, class, and gender and have more of an intersectional approach. So this is just a little bit about me. I kind of covered some of this. Um, the important takeaway on this slide is that I was covered in Time Magazine and you weren't. <laughs> if, you, if you actually look at the Time Magazine thing on the right, I don't know if you can see it on your monitors, but they ran out and they didn't want to spend any more room on me. So this is what Time does in any filler. You can't see that little red thing on the far right, but it says others who made a difference. And underneath there to my right are Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. It's like we all kind of hang out together. So my mom loved that grouping. Um, and uh, Michael mentioned I have several books out. The last one was called Queer Theory, Gender Theory, and it's the primer or simmer. And no, that is not me on the front cover. Um, a little bit about our presentation today. We're going to try to agree on language because terms and definitions around gender are highly contested and often used in overlapping and even contradicting manners. We'll talk a little bit about having a gender analysis, about gender norms for masculinity and feminine specifically, some common objections we often hear, the research and programmatic base and funding base for that matter, and then kind of what's next. Um, this presentation is actually based on uh, ones that I've given uh, to the White House, the CDC, and um, a number of other organizations. There's no reason to put that up here, except hopefully to <laughs> impress you with my bona fides. I think it's important to getting at every PowerPoint to take. So you all have probably heard of the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon that he's been in so many, so many movies that um, if you connect with anyone who's ever worked in Hollywood going back to the 1930s and six hops or less, um, I call this little exercise um, the six degrees of gender because the terms in gender are used in so many different ways and they're connected to so many parts of human behavior that um, we're not really sure how to talk about them. So um, this first slide actually is a good time to check your email because these are all things that we won't be talking very much about in the next 40 minutes. Uh, Ricky, actually, Ricky, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. I just we've had please. one or one or two people complain of having a little trouble hearing you. So please just do your best to speak up and speak as clearly as possible. I can actually change headsets while I'm speaking. Well, I'm that <laughs> that sounds that sounds like a great solution. Um, you have to tell me if that's any better though. Um, so biological sex which refers to primary and secondary bodily characteristics, hormones, um, chromosomes, and so forth. Gender identity, which is an inner sense of being male or female, um, um, really useful if you're talking about uh, transgender or transsexual people who, by definition, have uh, a sense of feel as a conflict between their inner sense of gender identity and their outer biological sex. Um, gender expression how we express feeling or being masculine or feminine through things like clothing, behavior, hairstyle, uh, even posture, vocal inflection, uh, gestures. Sexual orientation uh, and attraction, romantic attraction to members of one or more sexes. And now, if it'll turn pages, sometimes PowerPoint doesn't want to change pages. There we go. Gender equity refers to ensuring equal access to members of a community. Um, um, whether they're male or female, children, families, LGBTQ, et cetera. And I do hope that you guys can uh, hear me better now. Uh, gender norms, um, where we're going to spend most of our time today, are these socially constructed scripts and expectations for how to do, if you will, uh, boy or girl, man or woman, that we all kind of learn really from birth and usually pretty much mastered by late teens. Someone said, uh, in sex, as in uh, partner violence, uh, it's social norms, gender norms, that determines who does what, to whom, when, why, and for what reason. So very powerful, uh, even though often overlooked. And then finally, gender transformative, um, which refers to funding approaches, funding priorities, um, programmatic approaches, um, so, sorry about that, um, or um, policies that try to highlight, challenge, and ultimately change um, rigid gender norms and inequities. So when we're talking about gender transformative work, we are, we are implicitly talking about what Kimberly Crenshaw called the intersexual approach, which tries to use the gender analysis to look at how um, these overlapping spheres of race, class, sexual orientation, sex, and so forth, 
but also overlapping categories, women and girls, men and boys, LGBTQ. Um, so I may not always say it on every slide, but please know that that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at a complex analysis that actually tracks the way, the messy and complicated ways people actually live their lives with overlapping oppressions. I'm going to talk a little bit about the term gender analysis because it is very much uh, a contested term and used in many different ways. And I'll ask you to hang with me. This slide kind of goes on maybe a little too long, but I think it's worth doing. So here's, uh, these are all philanthropic and policy documents that are really popular right now. This one talks about a gender analysis and it says, you know, women, men, trans, intersex. They've been through intersex in there, so they're really being inclusive. But then, if you look at the sidebars, it all is about women. And we find this more and more. People are saying gender analysis in the philanthropic field, but what they're actually talking about is more funding for women and girls. Uh, this is a big policy document that was produced by the top organization in California. Uh, it talks about um, using a gender lens, right? Um, it uses the phrase women's health 93 times and the phrase men's health zero. Um, here's another one, uh, popular, this is a philanthropic uh, advisory document, talks about lesbians, gay men, bisexual, trans, etc. Also, I thought I'd just do a search on lesbians, never occurred in the document. So they did the kind of, they talked the talk up front, but failed to walk the walk. And, and if you search on the other terms, they don't appear in the PDF either. So they kind of said it, but then when they really got down to their main purpose of business, it was women and girls. And then finally, grant making with a gender lens, which frankly is, I think, is a wonderful document and has some great stuff in it. Um, but I wanted to see if they also included gender norms in their analysis. And when I did a search of the PDF, it came up, no matches were found. So the idea is, again, and here's funding for inclusion, which also talked about race and class, which I thought was really cool. Um, but those were the only two places that actually mentioned it. So we have, even when we're talking about just women and girls, um, we're not really doing so in an intersectional framework. So what I'm trying to do is not to pick on anybody here. I think some of these are fabulous documents, and many of them are resources that I use and even recommend. But we're talking about a gender analysis. We want to talk not only about gender equity, which means more funding for women and girls will equal some of what we're putting into men and boys, but also the importance of gender norms. We also want to talk about not just um, one category, women and girls, or men and boys, or LGBTQ. We also want to talk about um, um, young men and young boys. We want to talk about race, and we want to talk about class. We want a real intersectional analysis that is inclusive and diverse. And I just want to back up here, because I'm always at this slide very worried that I'll be misheard. I would be the last person on this call to, um, not to say that we do not need more funding for women and girls. We do. What I, we do desperately. What I am trying to say is that calling for that is not the same thing as having a gender lens or a gender analysis, and that we use them interchangeably. We're actually confusing people. I've had um, um, grantees who hear that a funder wants them to adopt a gender lens, and what they respond with is, oh, they want us to start a special program for women and girls. That's not what we want to communicate across the field, I think. And hopefully this presentation will help us do a little better with that. So why a gender lens? Why is it so important beyond just uh, ethical concerns and that's morally a good thing to do? Um, one of my program officers, uh, Beth Bendett um, at Blue Cross, said, you know, my grantees are starting to get race and class. They're even starting to get sexual orientation. You know, what happened to gender? What I want to know is what happened to the gender lens? And I was talking with Lauren Harris, who actually created the masculinities portfolio for it, and he said, you know, I related that quote, he said, you know, gender affects almost every issue that funders work on today. But grantees, and for that matter, program officers, are seldom challenged to do innovative work around gender. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why that keeps popping up, Michael. Gender, the way they do around race and class. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, innovative approaches. So let's talk a little bit specifically about gender norms, since I've kind of worked my way around them now, hopefully. Gender norms are learned, especially during the gender intensification period of late adolescence and early teens when interest in traditional norms starts to accelerate and belief in them solidifies. Yes, yes that is little Bow Wow kissing his biceps. Actually, he's, he's now grown up. We are now supposed to refer to him just as Bow Wow. Um, gender norms are highly regulated. Um, English language has an immensely elaborate vocabulary. 
uh, for stigmatizing the least degree of gender nonconformity. And unfortunately, any eight-year-old can produce a lot of these words uh, for you. And um, it obviously, is much more elaborate than this. Interestingly enough, for one of my books, I, I took a look through dictionaries trying to find if there were any positive ways to say something about gender nonconformity. And there simply isn't. There's no way to tell a young man, for instance, that he's doing a wonderful job of embracing his, his feminine side. You can tell him he's acting effeminate or girly, but it's, it's not going to come across as a compliment or anything he wants to hear. So if you think of words, and we'll, we're back to gender theory now and postmodernism, if you think of words as tools that cultures invent to do instrumental things, we've invented this really strong vocabulary for stigmatizing and regulating gender nonconformity, and no words whatsoever to say positive things about it. So think what that means in terms of where we're putting our social energy. Gender norms take practice. I don't know if you follow Boondocks. I love his work, but you can see the young man is doing all these fierce faces. And then um, his brother sticks his head in and says, still practicing your thug mug. And he says, yeah, keeping it real is hard work when you're cursed with cuteness. This is, this is a problem, by the way, Michael and I both share. We're both cursed with cuteness. But there's a joke here, but there's also a really serious message. Kids practice these things. By the time they're 21, you know, doing boy and doing girl, doing male and doing female seems natural. But actually, a lot of it is very, very learned and takes lots of practice. The impact of gender norms is enhanced in low-income environments. Um, where gender codes are often especially narrow, there may be really strong peer pressure on the street to man up, and the penalties for transgressing gender codes can often be, often be particularly harsh. So let's talk a little bit about the specifics of gender norms, of masculinity and femininity. This comes by way of Byron Hurt, who did this wonderful documentary about homophobia, misogyny in um, hip hop with a, a big grant from Ford. It's called Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes. We actually presented it with progressive rapper Talib Kweli at the Harlem Children's Zone and got a great turnout. You can actually check out the full thing at behurt.com, which is a terrible name for a website for a man who's fighting gender-based violence. But um, you can see the whole thing and have great discussions with kids. But um, and there's some rough language here, and I apologize for that up front, but it's just one of the best non-technical definitions of masculinity I think I've ever seen. Byron says, you know, we're in this box. In order to be in that box, you've got to be strong and tough. You've got to have girls and money. You've got to be a player. You've got to be in control. You have to dominate other men. And if you're not any of those things, then what happens? Well, when people call you soft or weak or a chump or a fag, and no one wants any of those things, so everybody stays inside the box. Now, that is a great working definition of traditional masculinity um, and also a pretty good sense of how uh, soft power, implicit power from the body at bottom up actually controls people just as much as big power in institutions and concrete buildings. Everybody stays inside the box. So what kind of beliefs come from um, traditional masculine norms? Well, someone, actually his name is uh, Michael Pleck, actually charted this. He found that the more you believe in traditional masculine norms as defined by strength, aggression, dominance, blah, 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 the more you're likely to believe that intimate relationships are adversarial, that women are responsible for conception, that pregnancy validates manhood, that having lots of girls and having lots of sex proves masculinity, that public control of women is part of manhood, and that force is sometimes necessary for men to control women. And those beliefs aren't just beliefs, they actually impact behavior. When you start to track those beliefs against actual behavior, you find that men who have, have high, strong belief in those have earlier sex, they have more sexual partners, including sex workers, they have less intimate relationships and more infidelity, they have more unplanned pregnancy, they have more sexual risk-taking, including gay men, because it's seen as, you know, really manly to take risks, and they have higher rates of partner abuse and sexual coercion. Now, I'm picking right here very obviously on um, reproductive health, and partner violence because they're really obvious targets because the research that we have goes back almost 25 years. But we could have developed this PowerPoint around educational underachievement, uh, economic empowerment. Um, there are a whole bunch of things that, and we'll see shortly, that tie very closely to a um, um, whole bunch of things that have lower outcomes when you have higher belief in um, um, traditional masculine or feminine norms. So um, I'm going to be doing mostly reproductive health and partner violence, but remember we could have been doing a, a number of different related areas. 
by the way, uh, just a, a, a cautionary tale about um, ripping pictures off the internet. I thought that was a great picture in the lower right hand corner. And I used to joke that uh, I don't know who these young guys are, I just don't want my daughter dating them. And then someone came up to me after a presentation and said, I know those guys, they went to the University of Phoenix, Tucson, it's a uh, University of Phoenix, at, at, uh, Arizona, sorry, at uh, Tucson. And I, as I was falling on my knees to apologize because they felt so bad, um, I think I was just jealous of their six pack and um, she said, no, no, that's who they were back then. They would love that you were using that picture. They were all frat boys. They're all dads now, and they have kids, and they get it. Um, but it was you got to be careful what you take off the Internet. So you could do the same thing. We've been doing masculinity around femininity. Um, feminine beliefs tend to stress that girls should be virgil and modest, but because femininity is always more contested and more complex than masculinity, they're also supposed to be hot, sexually attractive. That's a real double message for girls. They're supposed to be dependent and deferential, nurturing, maternal, caretaking. I believe that motherhood validates uh, womanhood. Having a man validates your feminine charms and that you're really attractive. And of course, it places a premium on older, stronger men. So how do those beliefs impact behavior? Again, the research has found out if you chart out strength of belief in traditional feminine norms, you get a whole bunch of, of lower outcomes. They're less likely to carry condoms. They're more likely to objectify their own bodies, more likely to defer to male sexual prerogatives, um, more likely to date older, stronger men, which just increases the natural uh, power and balance between uh, men and women, uh, more likely to tolerate uh, abuse or coercion, more likely to have uh, early or unwanted pregnancies. Um, it's just kind of a checklist for, for lower outcomes. Um, as I mentioned, it's not just reproductive and sexual health, but gender norms are also prominent in uh, partner violence, uh, economic empowerment, educational achievement, uh, LGBTQ bullying, uh, men who buy, uh, are more, buy more strongly into traditional gender norms uh, for masculinity are much more likely to engage in gay bullying and male on male violence. Uh, and then also impacts health and wellness. In fact, we're doing a big project for Heinz Endowments now that looks at uh, feminine norms and their impact on health and wellness uh, for young black women and girls. So um, because there is kind of this cluster of lower outcomes, um, some people have started to refer to gender norms as a gateway belief system um, with the idea that once you buy into these uh, narrow ideals for manhood or womanhood, um, you are more likely to have a, a, a lower life outcomes in a cluster uh, of related areas. So right about now we get um, some common objections. Um, one of them is, you know, can't we kind of do without all this gender lens? It's kind of complicated. Um, people have what I sometimes call jerkophobia when it comes to gender. They're afraid they look like a jerk when they try to explain it to their board or their program director or their grantees because, like I said, it's kind of squishy. So yes, we can do without a gender lens. Mostly we're already doing funding without a gender lens. We can also do funding without a race or class analysis. The question is, uh, is it effective? Are we really maximizing the social return on our philanthropic investment. I would say, kind of turning that question inside out, that adding a gender lens uh, really costs almost nothing. Uh, it's minimal cost and makes programs, if the, if the data is uh, any guide, it makes programs um, um, measurably more effective. So the uh, social return on the investment is actually real high for this. Doing good policy doesn't really cost much. Um, well, can't we just do gender equity? I get that a lot, especially um, from feminist-oriented funders. And I used to kind of make this argument on my own. I've, I've lately been helped by this wonderful report from the World Bank called On Norms and Agency. They looked, they've been funding gender equity uh, for years now, putting hundreds of millions of dollars in, in loans and outright grants into two dozen countries. And they found that their efforts simply were not getting them a bigger bang for the buck. They were reaching a point of diminishing returns. And so they did this study, which you know runs on for 160 pages. It's huge. And what they found was that what was holding them back was, of course, gender norms, that there are these cultural norms for what it means to be a good woman or a good girl, uh, or for that matter, even a good man. And unless you address those, you really cannot achieve equity past a certain point. More money doesn't get you more return on the dollar. You face a point of diminishing returns. And so I actually asked them, I said, you know what, who is the audience for a 160-page 
report. And he said, really, you found this because you troll for this. This is an internal document. He said, what we're doing is we're trying to train all of our economists that whenever they do new programs, they must consider gender norms. And he said, you know, we're economists. We are data-driven. We're not doing this because it's politically correct, and we're not doing it because it's the next cool thing. We're doing it because the data tells us it will make us more effective. So I think that's a really compelling argument. That even if you say, you know what, I don't care about reproductive health and partner violence. I really just care about increasing equity for women and girls. And I really just care about getting them, you know, more agency in these societies. To get there past a certain point, you still have to address cultural norms around gender. So thank you, World Bank. And then what about LGBTQ, which I kind of skated over. I'm always glad when someone pulls me back to my roots. I think the gender lens, and here I go back to gender theory, allows us, gives us actually a great tool for working what I call both sides of the street. I think most of us kind of get now that kids who are gender nonconforming often grow up in a world of pain and intolerance. What a gender lens allows you to look at is how even kids who are gender conforming, even the kids who buy into these and internalize these gender codes and are seen as conforming, are also harmed and have lower life outcomes in, in a number of very profound ways. So the gender lens actually gives you a great way to bridge those two things that some people might think belong in completely different uh, visions or philanthropic silos. And finally, so, you know, Ricky's now telling us that it's all gender, forget everything else, everything is gender. Uh, I'm, I hope I'm not being heard to say it. These are complex, as I said, intersectional issues. We're not saying that gender is the only dog in the fight. Um, we're not even saying that it's the biggest dog in the fight. What we are saying is it's the biggest dog not in the fight. If you were looking for the next big drop on the meter in philanthropic and programmatic effectiveness, you know, what's the next big thing we could be doing? Um, it would have to be gender norms. I mean, the data for, for two decades has said as clear as you can that this is a huge thing, and yet it really has not uh, filtered over out of the silos and impacted policies and programs. And by the way, I am a dog lover. Those dogs are not fighting. They are wrestling in the lower right-hand corner. So I just want to go back a little bit and, and just talk about that research base. There really is a very strong research base. I'm um, I, I'm not trying to sell you something that hasn't been established. I don't know if you guys use Google Scholar at all, but I love this. It'll help you to do searches that would have taken me um, weeks in the stacks uh, in a matter of minutes. I just did a couple searches uh, last week for this. Uh, I looked at masculinity and HIV prevention. You can see that Google Scholar turned up 10,000 articles. That's pretty cool. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a rough tool at best. Um, so half of those articles probably aren't on point, but even if it's two-thirds, you're still talking about thousands of articles. And by the way, uh, keep in mind that very first article, Love, Sex, Power, Considering Women's Realities in HIV Prevention, uh, by one of my heroes, Hortensia Morrow, which had been cited 965 times. I think it's almost at 1,000. I believe that may be one of the most cited reproductive health papers ever, and we'll come right back to it in a moment. Love, Sex, Power. I also did a search on femininity and HIV. You got 11,000 articles. Again, not on point, but even if half of them are, that's a huge base. And then I did a search on violence, women, and masculinity, and you come up with 90,000 articles. Holy moly. So when I say there's over two decades of research, I mean, the academics have really done their job. It's now uh, our job to bring this into uh, the applied world and out of the theoretical. So there's also a very strong programmatic base. Unfortunately, at this point, it's mostly international. Uh, UNAIDS, uh, USAID won't even fund new programs that lack a strong gender analysis. Uh, CARE, uh, PEPFAR, the President's AIDS Plan for Africa, it uses gender norms as central to its work. International Center for Research on Women, World Health Organization, uh, International Planned Parenthood, men are changing, what the optimism. Uh, we just talked about the World Bank and their focus on gender norms as the foundation of gender inequities. In fact, there's so much information circulating at the end. It's a cool fact. We should do that one again. There we go. Boy, PowerPoint makes you look good sometimes. Um, there's so much information circulating at the international level that USAID has even created the Interagency Gender Working Group, the world's worst named nonprofit, or the IGWG.org website, just to collate 
information and help people share what they're doing. Uh, we, we surf that website regularly to see when there are new reports. So a lot of cool stuff happening, but again, mostly uh, international uh, facing. When you get to the U.S., you can recall that about uh, 1992, the CDC pulled together 40 of the leading researchers in the country on reproductive health and youth of color and sent them on a retreat in Texas and said, tell us what the next thing is that we have to be doing to stop the HIV epidemic, which was detonating at that point in America's urban centers. So these 40 people spent two days, I think it was in Austin, and came back with this luminous paper written by Artensia, which is now quoted everywhere, Love, Sex, Power. And she said, you know what? Gender roles influence, if not define, the way young people act in interpersonal relations, sexual relationships. But we are ignoring them and acting as if each person is an individual entity. We are ignoring social factors like gender norms. Astounding as it may seem, the role of gender has been largely ignored, and we are studying sex in a gender vacuum. We are studying it in a gender vacuum. Well, you go, that's, you know, 1992, 95. Certainly this has percolated throughout the field, but it hasn't. Oh, I love that picture in the lower right. Cool kids. Um, these are the 10 characteristics of effective sexuality and HIV programs put out by the CDC. Where does it say gender norms? Nowhere. If you look at the bottom of the first column, you see include activities that address social pressures, blah, 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 blah but they still haven't got it almost 20 years later. In fact, sometimes I think True Child's only mission statement should be to add the 11th commandment, thou shalt say gender norms, and we can go out of business. So you have one of the most quoted papers ever, basically paid for by the CDC from 20 years ago, and here it is today, and they still haven't gotten the message. Just terrible disconnect. Here's emerging answers, one of the, the back of the Bible with teen pregnancy prevention, uh, 200 pages, where does it mention gender norms and masculinity? It mentions it in footnote number 295 in the title of Joe Clack's work on masculinity. I actually asked Doug Kirby, who wrote this, and is a, a legend and a giant in the field. And I said, how can you write 200 pages on teenage sexual behavior and not mention masculinity? And he said, we basically are trying to assess programs, and there simply weren't any programs to assess. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say as gently as possible is, my friends, this is what a research policy disconnect looks like when you have tens of thousands of articles going back 20 years, but it has no impact on, on funding and policy, then there's a disconnect. And that's, I hope if I leave you with nothing else today, it's with the idea that we need to heal this disconnect. And my hope is that the next generation of program officers, many of whom uh, have been marinated in gender theory or at least learned it, its outlines uh, in college and grad school will be ready to take this to the next level because this is the next thing on the block and it does need to happen and it will happen. It is starting to happen. There is a reconnect happening. Uh, there is a number of uh, core organizations out there that are putting gender at the center of their work and also a number of funders who have moved forward uh, significant grants uh, with a strong gender lens. So um, that's really encouraging to see. Um, that page needs to have just about double the number, uh, triple the number of funders and triple the number of, um, of nonprofits on it, but we'll get there. Um, I just want to offer for those of you that want to do a deeper dive on this subject, we try to create, um, I mentioned the IGWG.org website. We've really tried to build the True Child website as that kind of hub for information. So we have all the key studies uh, explained in common English. We have every paper that we can find that uh, on the gender transformative approach, whether we wrote it or someone else wrote it, we don't care, it goes up there. Um, we have PowerPoints, uh, we have one-pagers, briefing documents, if you want to send them around. Um, we have everything, every bit of intellectual collateral we've created is up there. So I hope for those of you that do want to go a little deeper, um, please use the website, download stuff, share it, that's, that's why it's up there, you don't need permission. And I guess with that, I want to thank you all for coming today. And uh, it's been kind of a very long slog, but I hope you got something out of it. And uh, Michael, this is a good time to turn it back to you in Q&A. Great. Thanks so much, Ricky. That was, that was wonderful and fascinating and eye-opening. I think a lot of us learned plenty. We have a couple of questions that came in already. So the first is from Nancy. Nancy's question um, is, 
what's a good example of a funding application question to help a potential grantee get at gender equity issues in their work? Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the simple ones might be, um, how do you think um, ideals for um, manhood or womanhood um, affect your population or your program? I'm sure there's probably a more artful way to put that, but that's just a, a really simple question. How do you think that, you know, gender ideals for manhood or womanhood might affect your population uh, or the effectiveness of your program. And um, one of the things we find, especially when you're pushing for a new question for grantees, is it's really important to say, you know, this, this is not going to be great and this is not a knockout question. We're just starting, you know, one day it might be, but we're just at this point trying to ask you to kind of grapple with this a little bit um, so that they're not afraid of, of, of getting it wrong or feel like it's, you know, one more thing they're being you know, push to do because we push grantees to do so much already. Thank you. That's, that's a great question. It's a great answer, too. Thanks, Ricky. Um, Thank you. We have another um, question from Gita. I hope I'm not butchering your name, Gita. Um, Gita's asking if you can say more about how gender norms are amplified in low-income environments. She's thinking of the amazing counter narratives that often arise out of necessity in low resource marginalized communities. Yeah, well, I, you know, um, almost everything is amplified, unfortunately, in low income uh, environments. Um, I, one of our, one of our um, um, program leaders used to say these aren't low income environments, they are disinvested communities. There's a reason for this, you know, we, they are disinvested. But um, I, I think what happens is when you get in these environments where um, people are compressed and have few resources, um, the social strictures are often, are, are in, in many ways, are such tight, are, are, are much tighter. Um, and especially when you realize that, you know, kids don't have the resources to more constructively uh, display masculinity or femininity uh, often. So, for instance, a young man who wants to show that, you know, he is, um, um, wants to display public masculinity and, you know, dominance and so forth, probably doesn't have the wherewithal to go out and buy um, the newest iPad fully loaded and flash it around or, you know, a Corvette um, like, you know, his peer out in, in the verbs might um, as Don McPherson, who, you know, was an NFL quarterback and works with young men of color, said, you know, um, in low-income environments, you have three ways to show you're a man. You can get lots of cash, you can get lots of girls, or you can throw the ball. So I, I think all of that plays in, um, especially with young girls sometimes uh, in low-income environments where um, there isn't the chance or as much of a chance of a college education and a good-paying job. They may feel that, you know, having children is, um, a, a good way to show uh, womanhood and to give them a sense of that they're doing something constructive uh, with their lives. So all these things, when you take resources away from people, all the effects, unfortunately, uh, can be amplified. Okay. Thanks for that answer, Ricky. Um, we have a couple questions are pouring in now. We have one from Chrissy. How do program officers and foundations integrate a gender transformative lens into their grant making strategies? I think we're still figuring that out. It's a wonderful question. I don't think we know yet. Um, I'm not familiar with any US grant makers who have done so, um, which is, makes my world a little bit schizo because when I go talk to international, these big donor agencies, they're all talking about it. And then when I sit down with, you know, the big foundations in the U.S., they're, they're barely discussing it, so it always feels a little funny. But I don't think anyone's done that yet. I don't think it's difficult. Uh, I think it tracks the same way that, you know, we integrated um, an analysis of race or class, and which many funders are now integrating uh, or asking about sexual orientation 
Um, I think it's a matter of making it a part of our, our vision, um, putting it in our policies, putting it in our funding priorities, asking our grantees to deal with it. To deal with it. Um, I do notice, just parenthetically, that a lot of the grants that we get uh, end up, for better or worse, being discretionary, which tells me that even the program officers that are supportive of this uh, still aren't 100 percent com comfortable taking it through their management and to the board. So I think in some cases, one of the first steps is, and we, offer, we do a lot of free trainings, I offer to go out and train people's boards or philanthropic management for free. Um, you know, just put me in front of them, we'll do the dog and pony show to try to raise their comfort level because a lot of times they're not sure how to discuss it either. Most of them probably are aware of it, they want to do the right thing, but they don't have the capacity, the expertise to start to figure out a gender analysis and that's where we try to fill that gap and raise their comfort level and their familiarity so they can do that. But to go back to your question, it's something that we're all figuring out right now. It has not really been done in the U.S. Hopefully some of the grant makers in this call will be the first. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. Thanks, Ricky. That's what, that's what EPIP does. <laughs> that's what Ricky is Tomorrow, doing. Tomorrow's leaders, today. <laughs> uh, we've got a, another question from Nikisha. Given the uh, significant... Hi, Nikisha. Given the significant focus on men and boys of color by philanthropy and even policymakers, and she's thinking specifically of the president's state State of the Union statement on boys of color, how do we advocate for an all-inclusive gender framework, one that's inclusive of women, girls, and gender non-conforming youth? That is a great question, too. These are all great questions. I love it. Um, I, you know, again, I think we're learning to do that dance. Um, there has been a real split in the field. Um, it sometimes feels like we're all picking sides. You know, there's a whole group of, of, of donors that are, you know, all focused on, on women and girls and a whole group that are all focused on, on men and boys. And it would be really helpful to adopt a gender framework that included both and also meshed it with things like LGBTQ. But I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I do, do like the fact that um, I mentioned the Heinz project that we've been working on, um, on the impact of gender norms on um, young black women and girls. What I especially like about that is not only um, that they're dealing with you know, uh, women and girls, where again there hasn't been enough funding, and specifically around young black women and girls, but um, there's another side of Heinz that is very focused on um, men and boys of color. So that tells me that you know the Heinz Endowment is probably doing as good a job as anyone of trying to juggle these two and, and, and you know ride both horses and keep them both moving. But I, I think we're still learning, you know, how to do that and how to get that balance right and how to integrate them so that we don't end up with these you know completely different silos, one silo for girls and one silo for boys, which is, which is kind of crazy. And hopefully, a gender analysis really helps us bridge them. So we don't see them as separate issues, but also being driven by common issues. That's great, Ricky. Thanks. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So we've, we've awed them into silence, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> if um, if if there aren't any more questions, and this is the last chance, then we'll probably wrap up just a bit early. And remember, as we said, this webinar will be available on our EPIP YouTube page, and soon enough we'll make it available on our website as well. Um, and I just want to jump in real quickly and say, um, pardon Michael, that if anyone, um, I think they were sent around, but if you didn't get them, the Heinz document on young black women and girls, which I mentioned, is on the front of our website. You can download it and read it any time. It's only about 10 pages. Very easy to read, very accessible. Please help yourself. And there's also a kind of briefing document, kind of our, our Gender Transformative Philanthropy 101, uh, called Gender Transformative Philanthropy. It also uh, is right there on the home page of our website in a carousel. Just click on it. It downloads immediately again about eight pages or so. Very easy to read and accessible. Please help yourself uh, to any of those uh, resources on our website. And don't uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me via email if you think we can be at help. Yes, I already actually see a few questions. People very eager 
to uh, get directly in touch with you with some follow-up questions. So we'll make sure to make your email available to all attendees, if you don't mind, Ricky. Um, awesome. Great. And I, I can speak from experience. Ricky is very, very quick to answer emails. So, um, so <laughs> you shouldn't have any problem hearing back from her. So um, again, Ricky, thank you so, so much. This was a wonderful conversation. Oh, thank you. I thank Emily and Rasan for having me. This has been a blast. And I think EPIP is such a unique organization and felt such a unique and necessary part in the food chain. I'm looking forward to coming to the Unity Summit and uh, being a part of all that. So thank you for the work that you're doing for letting me do this, being the first one. I'm honored this year. Thank you very much. And we are we are honored as well. And I think we kicked the year off right. And everyone who attended, thank you so much for coming. And we hope you you join us for future future webinars and especially in two weeks. Thanks again, everyone, and thanks again, Ricky. Thank you. Take care, everybody.